Then you're seeing it in terms of Dhamma or the way it is rather than in terms of, of uh, my, how I'm breathing and uh, my breath and, the, and all the, the um, conditions that arise from that assumption. My breathing, my breath, my body into being the Bhutto, the, the refuge, Bhutang Sarnangachami awakened consciousness of an individual we're all separate individuals at this moment you know this is a seeming conventional reality of this moment I'm here and you're over there but um, we're not emphasizing uh, the, that I myself is sitting here and you there but we're all engaging in this mindfulness practice to be aware of the way it is wherever your body is sitting, you know, whatever conditions you're experiencing. And then in, in meditation we start with the most obvious uh, conditions in the present, the posture and the breath. Inhaling on pu, exhaling on to, so that you're you're thinking the word while you're observing the inhalation. It'll it'll keep you from wandering in thought, and then exhaling with the syllable to, and just see what you know. Just try it for a few minutes, just to get a ex some momentary experience at this time with it. So this evening, the uh, first night, I know traveling and uh, moving from your homes to this uh, salubrious venue uh, and also settling in, so you're probably tired. Um, but also this uh, very uh, take time to just give a few reflections on this event. Uh, the, the guided meditation was an attempt to just give you basic, uh, for those who have already developed practice, but also uh, of those who have never, I know that there are so many uh, stories about meditation going around, uh, you know, both, uh, you know, it being a wonderful experience or a horrible one. And uh, some people think meditation is very difficult and um, that they're not ready for it or their, uh, you know, their doubts about their ability to do it. But Ajahn Chah always referred to it as a holiday of the heart. Pakpon Tang did die in Thai, and so I remember when I first uh, heard him say that. And then I, I thought, how do you translate Pakpon Tang did die? It's a holiday of the heart, and I thought, holiday? I'm not having a holiday. This is hard work <laughs> because my attitude was very much involved with a very willful, uh, intense practices, and uh, in, you know the whole. Uh, psychological mechanisms in me were always goal oriented, achieving, uh, proving myself, getting something, getting somewhere. And uh, one thing with meditation is that 
attitude does not help. All the kind of uh, go for it, get it, conquer the kalathas, uh, you know, work hard and get get a good result. With all this willfulness, uh, it was, uh, you know, I had plenty of willpower in those days and I could make myself do all kinds of things, but the result was never very peaceful or, uh, or not, certainly not liberating in any way. And in Ajahn Chah's uh, reflection of the uh, holiday of the heart, and uh, began to think a holiday is where, you know, you, you like holidays because you can rest, you don't have to try and prove yourself. You're having a, a holiday today. Holiday of the heart means of the mind and the heart, the jitta. So just contemplate that. Then when notice your own uh, attitudes about Buddhist meditation, whatever they might be, you know, whether you know they, you're expecting or dreading or you think it's hard work or you think you can do it or you can't, Whatever you think, just be the Bhutto, the observer. This is my advice. Be that Bhutto is, is at ease with everything, accepts everything. Bhutto doesn't, uh, you know, it's not about picking and choosing and preferences and liking and disliking and, and uh, trying to get something or get rid of something. This sense of awareness, Bhutto is it's totally accepting of everything, whatever, you know, the pain in your body or the pleasure, the, the good thoughts, bad thoughts, the uh, happiness, sadness, despair, whatever uh, emotional qualities you're experiencing. Bhutto is not judgmental, not uh, condemning, not uh, criticizing, but note, noting, discerning. So this is an attitude I found very helpful in my own, you know, to deal with my own character, which was, you know, very American uh, condition, personality. Uh, you know, being American, you're very, uh, you're brought up to be a winner, to get somewhere, prove yourself. It's all about competition. And, uh, and even though American values are all very high-minded about equality and egalitarianism and so forth. The, the result of this is that it's endlessly competitive. And uh, you're brought up, you know, you don't, you know, you're to, to compete. And who's ever, you know, runs faster or is taller, or whatever. <laughs> you're always comparing yourself with uh, those who you think are better off or can do things better than you can. And, and then also, one can feel, look down on those who, who aren't as good as you think you are. With meditation, our relationship to this ego is to observe it, not to uh, reinforce it or to judge it, just to notice. To be the, the puto, the knower of the way it is. And then the vipassana reflection is always all conditions are impermanent. Now this is, uh, this is, you know, the, the all condition phenomena. This means everything, the body, uh, the, the posture of the body, the sensations of the body, uh, the senses, what you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, all your emotions, memories, the whole psycho, physiological conditions that we're experiencing now, it's all about impermanence, anicca. That includes both of them from the very subtle to the very coarse. Because con conditioned phenomena has infinite varieties, qualities, quantities and so forth. It's, it's forever changing uh, and it's um, and in, it always moves like your breath. It, you, you have an inhalation which conditions its opposite, the exhalation. At this time in society, you know, the, the economic crash uh, that everyone's experiencing, especially in, 
like in Europe or America, where the um, the idea of progress was the ideal that we all operated from, you know, that everything was going to get better and better. And that progress is just, you know, moving from better to better to better. And of course a Buddhist who knows Dhamma knows that progress, uh, you can only progress to a point and then it goes the other way, just like your breath. You know, you can only inhale so far, and then you have to exhale. One depends on the other. And so this, uh, and this applies to all conditioned phenomena, whether it's uh, econ economics, political, uh, social, whether it's, uh, you know, through sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, uh, whether it's emotional, or it's, uh, you know, anything physical, the sun, the moon, the stars, the universe. Now, in turn, the Buddha pointed to not to that things that are so remote, so out of our direct ability to observe their changingness, to the most obvious realities of the here and now. This physical body and its and its mental activities. Once we understand from this much. Uh, then the rest applies to the whole universe. You know, it's not; it's extrapolated to to the on the um, ma uh, ma macrocosmic scale. But the microcosm of one's own conscious moments at this time, within the restriction that we're all experiencing through the physical forms that we live with, this is what we learn from from this form here the way it is, with the mental states, whatever they might be, uh, good, bad, inspired, depressed, right, wrong, uh, emotions, memories, sensory uh, contact in, in its various forms, is when you pay attention, and this is, this is mindfulness, the Bhutto knows the way it is, all conditions are impermanent. So these words like Puto and Dhammo, you know, they, they, these go together, Buddha and Dhamma. Uh, and Buddha then implies, you know, like, a, like you can have a Buddha Rupa, like behind me on the piano is a Buddha image. And so, uh, you know, so the Buddha always has this, uh, Buddha Rupa is a form, human form. So what does that mean to you, you know? Is it is it, is it represent some historical sage of the past? It can do that, you know. The Buddha. This is the uh, Tamajaka Buddha teaching the four noble truths, the mudras, and everything. But it is a human, human, iconic human form. But it, it represents the human individual in a state of awareness awakened attention. If you notice that all Buddha images have this sense of attentiveness, awakened consciousness. You know, they're, they're peaceful forms usually, Buddha images. And this is a, this is an icon that is, that is, uh, that we use in Buddhism, but in other religions they don't seem to have such a form. You know, like in, uh, when you compare it to Christian symbolism with the crucifix or the, you know, the various forms of passions in, in European sculpture. And I remember uh, in being in Paris one time, uh, walking through the, uh, the park near the Eiffel Tower and these beautiful public parks with all their huge kind of uh, bronze sculptures of warriors you know, male figures in the in state of passion and fighting and anger and fearsome male figures, and then the female figures were usually of women, very haughty, kind of uh, very look very unpleasant, uh, kind of like queens and and upper class ladies that that think they're better than the rest. So you, <laughs> so you. You go through looking at these uh, sculptures, public sculptures in 
park in Paris and uh, it has a certain effect on the mind. You know, the, the male figure as a warrior, fighting, angry, conquering, and the female figure as a very authoritative, a haughty, uh, presumptuous uh, 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 form of, of a woman's figure. And then we went to the Guimet Museum in Paris, where, which was nearby, where they have the uh, Oriental art. And so we walked into the Guimet Museum where they have a, a very good collection of Khmer Buddha images from Cambodia. And of course the French are very good at setting these images off with lighting and the most serene looking forms of, of Khmer uh, uh, sculpture of Buddha in stone. And, and these represented the human form in the state of attention. Was not a, a warrior, was not, uh, you know, acting like their superior, there's not a king or a queen or uh, somebody important. Uh, it's not trying to, to promote itself as through passion and emotion, but through calm and peace. And this is Bhutto then, this, this word, this mantra, Bhutto. Is, um, is, you know, as we develop and, and cultivate this sense of Bhutto in our lives, it means that we're not trying to be, um, become Buddhas as some kind of personal endeavor. That's missing the point. It's taking refuge always in the here and now, learning to, to trust this ability that each one of us has to pay attention in the present. And so in a retreat like this, we start out with the obvious, the, the, sitting, the sitting posture and the breath. Because that's here and now. Then I, then I uh, suggest the use of this mantra puto, because I'm trying to, to, to challenge this idea that you are somebody who needs to get something or do something. You know, you, because with meditation we can, we can approach uh, Buddhist meditation is I've got to get my concentration, I've got to get something I don't have, I've got to get rid of my wandering mind, of my defilements. Uh, and this is, you know, the, the sense of a self that, that has to get something, we're doing meditating in order to get something in the future or get rid of something that we have, that we don't want. Now, in the Buddha's teaching is this direct, in the, when we take the refuges, they, they in the very beginning, when you took the three refuges, that's, that's a statement that you, you know, whether it's just ceremonial or not, but actually what that is, is a statement that you're now in a refuge of enlightened awareness. Now, when you try to think about this from the ego level, it, you know, it doesn't make sense because the ego is not enlightened. Not, you know, the ego can never be aware of itself, but you can be aware that there's this, Bhutto is aware of the ego. And so this is a, a reflection for observing, you know, learning to to no longer operate from the basic delusion of I have to meditate in order to get something or get rid of something, but to the attitude more of reminding yourself that being a human individual, uh, this is a teaching for human beings. It's, a, it's a, an ancient teaching that the Buddha in his first sermon after his enlightenment, used this teaching, the Four Noble Truths, as a, his first sermon after enlightenment. And, and it's a very interesting approach the Buddha used because he, he was uh, pointing to something that we all recognize, suffering. Something that's nothing subtle, uh, about suffering, is there? We all can relate to that. Whether you're rich or poor, male or female, whatever age, 
young or old, suffering is the common bond we all have as human beings and as creatures, because the animal world is suffering. Now the Buddha takes this very banal and ordinary human experience and puts it into category of a noble truth. And this is very interesting because Buddha, um, Buddhism is the only religion that really does this. And in interfaith meetings in London, for example, you have uh, now England, the British, UK is a kind of multi-religious society. It's no longer just Christian. There's so many Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and all other forms of different types of religions that are present there. And so you have these interfaith uh, meetings trying to understand other religions and of course other religions don't quite get Buddhism because especially the theistic ones like Judaism, Christianity and Islam because uh, they are always starting from the top you know I believe in God or a statement about ultimate uh, the ultimate and the Buddha is, you know, his statement is a noble truth, not ultimate truth, that there is suffering. And so he's taking this most common human experience and placing it in a place, it's, it's the first noble truth after his enlightenment. There is, it's a statement, there is suffering. There is dukkha. And then, uh, and this is a noble truth. So what's noble about this truth is that we're changing our attitude from I suffer to there is suffering. Now notice the difference. I suffer because of this or that, because of you, because of the weather, because of, uh, you know, the, my health and so forth. So we, we think of suffering as something we don't want something that's caused by external sources. And then, but that's not, there's nothing noble in that. That's just how it seems to us uh, in our ordinary way of thinking in conventional attitudes. But now the challenge is to awaken to there is suffering, which is not about, uh, you know, blaming it on anybody or anything external, but recognizing it. There is this sense of anxiety about the future, or uh, worry, or uh, regret, or guilt about the past, or, uh, you know, it can be very, just on the level of worrying, or it can be, you know, very strong sense of, of being persecuted and then feeling angry and indignant by the way other people treat you or abuse you. So, you know, like in, uh, we can think that somebody who's abusing, you know, somebody's abusing me, I think they're the cause of my suffering. But it's a noble truth. That person that is physically abusing me is, uh, you know, he's hurting this form. But my suffering is my aversion, anger, and resentment toward that person. So there's a, a difference between if I just get caught in anger, hatred and resentment then I'm suffering from the abuse that somebody else is projecting toward me. But if I don't, if I use panya or wisdom then uh, I know I, even though I'm being physically abused I'm not creating suffering in my mind. So these are the, these are the ways of wisdom in which we can, sometimes life does present us with unfair blame and abuse from others and whatnot, and and then we think, we're, you know, it's unfair, and on the ego level it's very painful, very hurtful, uh, and we, the tendency is to think it's somebody else's fault. But in this way we're changing to the noble truth, there is suffering, to observing our own not wanting, uh, our, our way we, we are personally programmed or conditioned to hate somebody or resent. 
And that which knows these mental states is a Bhutto, knowing the Dhamma, the Dhammo, knowing the way it is, all conditions that you're experiencing, whatever condition you're experiencing now, whether it's physical, emotional or mental, is, you know, it can be pain, pleasurable or painful, is impermanent, anicca. So this is a key word for investigating, uh, in the, investigating the way it is. And this is what we call vipassana meditation, which is uh, insight, looking into the way things are. And then the, these Buddhist teachings, of, like the first sermon, the Four Noble Truths, is a very skillful uh, means that the Buddha gave uh, 2,552 years ago uh, and and is uh, and that's why at this time in modern Malaysia uh, this teaching applies doesn't it it's not about you know some kind of exotic time in India in the past or it's not about Indian culture uh, or anything like that it's about our human state it applies to us in England, to everywhere, you know, suffering and the end of suffering. And, and it, it's a timeless teaching because, it know, you know, it applied to the conditions, the human people that the Buddha encountered in ancient India 2,552 years ago. And it still applies at this very moment, here in this uh, salubrious venue in this very lovely country. We can still create endless suffering here. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then blame it on some, somebody or blame it on oneself. <clears throat> so you see this, uh, during this time that, that we're on retreat here, uh, these kind of reflections, I'll try to, to keep encouraging you uh, and pointing, and the point, the, the main emphasis is always this here and now Dhamma. Until you, you know, we do need, need to be reminded because the, the worldly mind, the conditioned ego, is, it's all about doing something now to get something in the future. And so I noticed in, uh, you know, when I first, I've been living in, in the UK since 1977. So that's like over 33 years and in that country so and the Buddhists uh, there for example when I first went there I noticed so many of them had uh, the British Buddhists that were that were keen on meditation had uh, you know still so many doubts and uh, some of them were very you know diligent and uh, serious practitioners of various techniques that were available then in England and um, one man I remember he was a quite a you know is a retired solicitor very gentlemanly polite urbane kind of English man who who had practiced uh, a meditation technique for 20 years very strict uh, kind of meditation technique and then he came to me one day and he said you know Ajahn Sumedho I've, I've been doing this for 20 years and I've got nothing from it <laughs> and he was, he was in despair because you know his, with all his good intentions and his uh, determination the basic problem had never been recognized you know I'm doing this in order to get some result in the future if I practice hard this technique over and over again, then I should get uh, some reward for it or some insight in the future. Uh, so even after 20 years, even in his home, he had a shrine room, very lovely shrine room. And I know he was a very disciplined person, but this sense of despair, 20 years without any, and I've gotten nowhere, he said. 
And so I pointed out, you know, he never really reflected on what he was doing. He had a kind of faith that in a technique or some idea that if he kept doing this, uh, he would be rewarded in some way for doing it. And this is all the ego and the cultural conditioning operating, you know, that we, we, we are so used to, so close to us, so identified with, we can't see it. And that's where these, these, um, these, uh, like the refuges, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, they're, they're meant not to be identities or just merely exotic words that, or, you know, some kind of uh, uh, just Buddhist uh, terminology, but they're actually skillful means to, to really get to the causes of suffering. It's not me, Ajahn Sumedho, that can solve, that it can be enlightened or get somewhere in my practice. It's through surrendering to Bhutto, to awareness, that the that, that Dhamma is recognized and understood. You see, so people ask me, what have you, what have you gained, you know, 43 years as a Buddhist monk? And, uh, uh, you know, the, what put me in some category? Uh, are you a Sotapanna? Are you a Sakatakami? Are you an Anakami? Uh, are you an Arahant? And this kind of thing, because uh, people see this as the ego operating, you know, in terms of taking these terminologies and applying them as attainments, personal, individual attainment. But when you when you really contemplate the structure that the Buddha gave us in the Pali scripture, in the Pali suttas, that's, those teachings are not about attaining or achieving, but it's all about relinquishing through awareness. And, and so that as long as it's ignorance of Dhamma, as, you know, no matter how good our intentions might be on a personal level, it will only take us so far and and then we can't go any further, you know, it, it might be skillful and good and kusala, you know, skillful dhamma, but for liberation we need to break out of the conditioned uh, assumptions we have into the immediate awareness of the here and now and cultivate this. And this, so this retreat is, is an attempt uh, to encourage you toward this and to, to keep reminding you uh, so that, you know, because you will forget and get caught up in your own scenarios and, and habits. But this is not a trying to browbeat you into doing what, anything, but to encourage you to awaken and to trust, to begin to recognize what awareness is and what the refuge is, and so you can really trust it and have confidence in it, so that after 20 years you're not saying, oh, I've been meditating diligently for 20 years and I'm nowhere. And it wasn't because uh, he, it was an ego saying I'm nowhere because he was expecting to be somewhere. But when, you know, in terms of my own experience, I say the personality, you know, my personality, my ego, hasn't gotten anywhere. It hasn't changed that much. <laughs> but, the, but the sense of understanding and uh, this, this uh, confidence in relinquishing uh, increases. When you see, when you prove through investigation and see for yourself the peace that comes through letting go and relinquishing, then it's not about, it's not personal attainment at all. I can't claim it. It's some kind of personal result of my efforts uh, to meditate. It's return, it's like 
returning to that natural place uh, we call the deathless reality and, and rather than being so always deluded and limited by the death bound conditions that we identify with so Ajahn Chah would call this in, in, in kind of uh, ordinary language our real home and there's a nice little booklet out in English called Our Real Home. What is our real home? Is it Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur? For me, is it am I my real home in Seattle, Washington, or in in Amaravati in England, or in Wat Papong in Thailand? Where do I belong? Where is my real home? And of course, this when Ajahn Chah was talking about our real home, he was pointing here. And he always pointed to, you know, says, watch your mind. And ties do jit. Observe. Be the awakened, conscious awakened being. So you, and you, <coughs> you investigate the conditions you're experiencing. Not through uh, identity or judgment, but through discerning them. And so the Bhutto is our ability to observe the changingness of conditioned phenomena whatever its quality might be pleasant, painful you know whatever the conditions whether it's the inhalation, exhalation whether it's uh, um, inspiration or despair uh, emotional conditions that which is aware of conditions is not a condition and so, just for convenience, we call that the Bhutto. And that's the, that's the refuge. And the position we are taking now during this retreat, being this awareness, rather than uh, trying to be somebody who's getting somewhere in their meditation practice. So I'll just offer this as a reflection and uh, there will be time for discussions in the future but I know this you know this is many many sometimes very difficult to understand um, because it's it's a going against the whole the whole conditioning process of any culture you know it's it's uh, it's trying to you know it's a it's really, you know, I see in, in my life how that, you know, going against this, the stream of the world, of, of the assumptions of an ignorant society. And I find this even more so now living in, in, uh, in Europe where it has stable government and, and even, you know, the economy crashes, it's not really affected us in the monastery. <laughs> we wouldn't even know there's a problem. <laughs> People come and tell us. But <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, uh, you know, it is uh, in terms of worldly conditions, it's a very nice country to live in, well run, uh, uh, you know, fairly good economy, uh, in the past, now maybe it's a bit having problems, but probably will, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But even, even at the best of times, you know, this, uh, the world is changing, society, we can see uh, wherever we go now, there's this uh, incredible migration of peoples, immigration, um, people moving from one place to another, uh, world population, pollution, and all the doomsday predictions that are prevalent at this time. So it is a time where there is a lot of change and uncontrollable uh, things that, that we, you know, we, we can worry about. But what we can do is cultivate this awareness which will allow us to deal with what you know the, the, the conditions of the 
places we're living in with the experiences that we have. We can do the uh, chant before we dismiss. May I abide in well-being in freedom from affliction in freedom from hostility in freedom from ill will in freedom from anxiety and may I maintain well-being in myself may everyone abide in well-being in freedom from hostility in freedom from ill will in freedom from Yeah.